This is the download edition of World Business Report on Monday the 2nd of February. I'm Susanna Streeter. Greece's new finance minister begins a charm offensive around Europe. We will come to every European capital like we're here today with very sensible proposals for putting Greece off the headlines. But will a funding lifeline for Greek banks continue? We find out why anti-tax avoidance campaigners have a powerful new ally. It's not coming from the heart. It's coming from a pragmatic realization that this might be a path forward to get part of his agenda. And strumming into the big time. Why sales of the ukulele are soaring. That's all coming up. The new Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, has embarked on a grand European tour. You could call it a charm offensive to try and persuade his European neighbours to lighten Greece's heavy burden of debt. There's still 320 billion euros of it. The states couldn't be higher. Greece's banks can only get vital life support from Europe's central bank if there's a clear, agreed way forward for the country's debts. Without the life support, Greece can't stay in the euro. But looking relaxed in a green leather chair at Downing Street, Yanis Varoukakis has told the UK's finance minister, Chancellor George Osborne, that it was time for Greece to look to the future out of the limelight. We will come to every European capital like we're here today with very sensible proposals for putting Greece off the headlines. But for the moment, Greece is still firmly in the headlines. And with the worries about Greek bank accounts being converted from euros back to drachmas, cash has been steadily fleeing the country. The BBC's economics editor, Robert Peston, told me that a failure of Greece's current charm offensive could have dire consequences for Greece and the rest of the eurozone. This is you know, a hugely scary actually negotiation that's going on for i mean broadly because you know the stakes are really all about whether greece can stay in the euro and if it doesn't stay in the euro well that could be very costly for greece it could be very costly for the whole of europe and we do seem to have two uh, you know rather irreconcilable positions we've got greece saying they want an easing of the debt terms and an end to austerity. Um, We've got other Eurozone governments saying, well, we bailed you out and a deal is a deal. You've got to repay the debt on the terms that we've set out and you you know, the previous government agreed. And by the way, austerity is part of the deal. And the Greek government says perhaps they have until May, really. That's the deadline they're working to. But there's another deadline looming, isn't there? Yes. I mean, the current bailout ends at the end of the month on February the 28th. And I think that's a really momentous date. And the reason it's a momentous date is because the only reason that the Greek economy is currently able to sort of tick over and avoid default and collapse is because the European Central Bank is lending to Greek banks under a mechanism called emergency liquidity assistance. And the reason Greek banks need emergency help from the European Central Bank is because there is nervousness among people who've got money in Greek banks that actually Greece could leave the euro. At the moment that Greece were to leave the euro, you know, there's a genuine risk that if you've got savings in Greece, they would collapse in value. So people are taking out their euros. So when the European Central Bank lends to Greek banks, It doesn't do so on an unsecured basis. It wants to protect itself. So it says, we want collateral, we want security. And the security it gets is Greek government bonds. Okay. Now, under the rules of the European Central Bank, it can't take government bonds if those bonds have a junk status, if they are rated as junk by credit rating agencies. The thing is that Greek government bonds are rated as junk by the ratings agency. But the European Central Bank continues to lend. Why is that? It's because they've given a special waiver to Greece because it is adhering to the bailout terms. So, So the lending only goes on for as long as Greece sticks to the bailout terms. So at the moment that there was a formal recognition 
that, the, that it's no longer sticking to the bailout terms. The European Central Bank, in theory, could no longer lend to the banks. The banks would collapse. The Greek government couldn't fund itself because actually one of the ways the, go- the Greek government is funding itself is by borrowing from those banks. And, you know, we would get a catastrophe. We and would... who makes that call? Well a trio of organisations that monitor Greece. They're called the Troika, uh, and they are the IMF, uh, the International Monetary Fund, uh, the European Commission, and the European Central Bank itself. And, you know, in theory, if they were to determine that Greece were no longer uh, adhering to the bailout terms, well, at that point, the game is up. And that was the BBC's Robert Peston. Well, let's take a look at the financial markets now with Jeremy Batstone Carr from Charles Stanley. Hello there. Hi there. Jeremy, so as far as the markets are concerned, what about these latest twists in the whole story of Greece? Are they taking much notice of this grand European tour? Not specifically today, but I do think this is a slow burn story. What's at issue here, of course, is that Greece are saying that the gloves need to come off, so to speak, or the straitjacket needs to come off. Greece has to be allowed to grow. And this message is beginning to gain some traction. Over the weekend, we heard France make some approving noises. And also, even in the United States, the White House saying they too have some sympathy with the Greek position. So I sense that the markets are going to take some time to digest this. What, of course, it means is that the EU treaty rules requiring debts to be limited within the Maastricht criteria may be loosened somewhat. Other than that, though, there has been some numbers out as far as Europe's manufacturing industry goes, which has been slightly lifting for the markets today. That's absolutely right. Uh, the manufacturing surveys uh, from around Europe were painted a little bit more positive a picture than had previously been reported and indeed expected, suggesting that whilst the Eurozone is still in a very dire position, it may be beginning to emerge from its torpor. That's good news, but not quite so good for all airline stocks, despite some very positive results out from one airline. Indeed, Ryanair. Uh, However, the good news for many uh, industries is that, well, not many industries, the the, the oil price is rising. That's positive. Uh, But of course, for those companies that are heavily dependent on oil, if this trend continues, it could potentially be somewhat damaging. So I think airlines were a bit of a mixed bag today. OK, Jeremy Batstone Carr from Charles Stanley. Thank you very much. Now, some latest numbers for you in London. The 100 share index is up 0.5% at 67.83. And in New York, the Dow is up 0.1% at 17,182. Tax havens, let me name some Jersey and the Caymans And a general British islands And a Europe's main then Luxembourg and some... That's Money on an Island, a rap by the group Apocalyptics. They're campaigning to stop firms relocating to tax havens to minimise what they pay out. And now, anti-tax avoidance campaigners have won a powerful new ally, the President of the United States. At a time when our economy is growing and our businesses are creating jobs at the fastest pace since the 1990s and wages are starting to rise again, we've got some fundamental choices to make about the kind of country we want to be. Will we accept an economy where only a few of us do spectacularly well? Or are we going to build an economy where everyone who works hard has a chance to get ahead? This country does best when everybody gets a fair shot. And everybody's doing their fair share and everybody plays by the same set of rules. In the budget he's just sent to Congress for 2016, it includes a plan for a one-off 14% tax on more than $2 trillion held offshore by large corporations. He'd already called on companies, he'd already called companies unpatriotic for relocating just to reduce their tax burden. So is this just a popular stunt or could the proposal be passed? Well, Gary Huffbauer from, is from the Peterson Institute for International Economics and he told me that there was quite a lot of compromise in the president's budget. No, he's been on this agenda, I would say, for his whole term in office, so since 2008. I mean, this is something that he's wanted It reflects his views that overseas investment by U.S. firms is not particularly good for the United States. But he's repackaged his proposals in a way that is somewhat more acceptable to the Republican majority in Congress. So what's he done? He's offered a bit of stick and, interestingly, a carrot as well. You put it exactly right. The stick is that he's going to tax unrepatriated earnings. Now, this isn't cash. This is just money 
that firms have abroad that they didn't bring back to the U.S. They may have invested it in plant, equipment, uh, distribution systems, whatever. We don't have a really good fix on the number, but it's about two trillion, and he wants to tax that at a fourteen percent rate. He thinks most of it is in tax haven countries. We don't know that for sure. He hopes to raise a little north of two hundred billion dollars on that one-time charge, and then his carrot is that he would come back from earlier proposals that the Obama administration made and tax future profits that are not brought back to the United States at a lower than U.S. tax rate. Our tax rate is now 35 percent. So he would tax these future profits earned abroad at 19 percent. If the money is actually brought back to the United States and invested here in the United States, then that would be an offset against the tax. So is this compromise somewhat of a surprise, or do you just think it's realistic, given the fact that the Democrats uh, don't have the majority in Congress? Oh, absolutely. It's a realistic, pragmatic step. He'd like to do something in the last two years in office, and he's making progress on trade with the Republicans. But on tax, he knows that he cannot get anything through unless he comes quite a ways towards the Republican position. This is a first step. It's not all the distance you'll have to travel. It's not coming from the heart. It's coming from a pragmatic realization that this might be a path forward to get part of his agenda. Because, of course, corporate America will be lobbying hard to stop this going through in its entirety. They argue, of course, that uh, such measures in law allow them to do their business properly. Oh, absolutely. And if you look at the U.S. tax system on corporate America, as you say, which let me just define that as pretty large corporations, the kind of names that we think of when we think of corporate America, our taxes are higher than any other advanced country in almost any other country on corporate America. And then corporate America tries to wiggle out of this tax burden by various devices. They've got lots of lawyers working and so forth. And one of them is to keep profits abroad, not to bring them back and have them subject to high taxation when they're brought back. And the Republican view, and it's a view I share, is that the U.S. needs to reform its basic tax system to really reduce the discrepancy between the very high taxes we have and the much lower taxes that, for example, Britain has, or even France, much less Ireland or Canada or China. So um, this is kind of a step in, in that direction, and corporate America doesn't want any changes that increase the wedge between the U.S. tax burden on corporate America and the burden that other countries place on their corporations. And that was Gary Huffbauer from the Peterson Institute for International Economics. You're listening to World Business Report from the BBC World Service. Still to come, we'll be busting the myth of ambition in the workplace. Lucy Kellaway explains why workers are wise to avoid promotion. Being a middle manager is simply the most thankless job ever invented. Workers are not idiots. They look at what the people above them are doing and think, no way. That's coming up. It's a cheap computer on a small square of circuit board aimed at giving the children, in particular, the chance to start programming or coding, as it's now called. But it's sold in its millions. The Raspberry Pi is fast becoming Britain's most successful computer and now the charity behind it have set their sights on exporting the product all over the world. Today a new version was unveiled, offering child coders and others a faster processor and more memory than ever before, but at about the same price. Well, I asked Eben Upton, who is the founder of Raspberry Pi, if he was surprised that his modest product has become so successful. It's been successful beyond our wildest dreams. So uh, when we started this project, we thought we might sell 10 or 20,000 of these, of these computers, best case. Um, we've sold over 4.5 million of them. We think somewhere between 1 and 2 million of those have gone into the hands of children. Um, and we're actually really now starting to see the, the impact of that on university admissions in particular, on the number of people applying to study computer science at university. So it's made a massive difference so far, you think. What is it about the Raspberry Pi? Describe how it works, what it looks like that's really encouraged children and teenagers in particular and those looking to go to university to get involved in coding a lot more. 
Raspberry Pi is a credit card sized computer, so it's almost exactly the size of a credit card. It's a bare PCB, so it has no case by default. Uh, you plug it into your television, you plug a mouse and a keyboard into it, you can power it using your mobile phone charger. And it comes installed with uh, things children will find fun, so it has, for example, a copy of Minecraft on there, and it has a media player, but it also comes installed with all of the tools that you might need to become a professional computer programmer. I think children are taken to it because it's uh, not in a shiny box, rather than taking to it in spite of that. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Because normally, as you say, the, there uh, you would think that children would be more lured to to the amazing games that you can play on it. But it, it, this really goes back to basics, doesn't it? Yeah, I think children are often lured to to learning things that their parents don't know. You know, children like having secret knowledge, uh, and and so having a platform that has this level of hackability that people can just play around with it um, gives children a chance to do those things their parents just don't understand. I think that can be very attractive to people. Now, you started off with quite modest aims. What were you doing at the time when you realised there was this kind of gap, not just in the market, but in knowledge as well? So I was teaching at the university in Cambridge, and one of, one of my jobs was to go and find new 18-year-olds to come and study computer science. And we found that, A, many fewer people were interested in doing it than, than 10 years before. So I was doing this in about 2005. So we'd had a decline in the number of people. We'd also had a decline in the sorts of things those people knew how to do when they arrived. Um, and really, Raspberry Pi was a, a, an attempt on the part of several of us at the university to kind of reboot some of that um, computing culture we had, had that in the 1980s and give children in the 2000s some of those experiences that some of us had when we were children. Tell me more about this new model, six times more powerful than the current model. Why does it need to be uh, that much more powerful? We saw an increasing number of people trying to use it actually as a PC. And while it's very close to being a viable general purpose computer, it falls a little short in some areas. You know, the web browsing performance perhaps was not quite what we would like. And so we've, we've, added, these, we've added these features primarily to make the platform more kind of ge- generally attractive. Don't you run the risk, though, of, of starting a, a pie war, like some children who've got the old version feeling a bit behind the times? Um, there, is that, there is that risk. Uh, I think that you know, one of the reasons we try to keep this thing, this thing costs, you know, the, the deluxe version we're releasing today costs 35 US dollars. The, the discount, the cheapest version or entry-level version costs 20 dollars. So we try to keep this thing almost pocket money cheap. Um, so I, we hope that too many people will forgive us. Why do you think it's so important for children to learn how to code? Coding provides children, A, with an opportunity to be professional engineers, which I, I, I happen to think is a, is a great job, um, and, and can be a real ladder, actually, for social mobility. Um, you know, if you're good at engineering, it doesn't matter what your background is. I think also the skills that you learn through coding can be, a, can be of use to you, that you learn a kind of an analytical thinking, a critical thinking, uh, which can be of use to you in, in a lot of other careers as well. And that was the founder of the Raspberry Pi. Pajamas lying side by side Ladies night as I have spied I've often seen what goes inside When I'm cleaning windows George Formby, the unmistakable ukulele player Not what you'll describe as cool perhaps But suddenly the ukulele has acquired some serious street cred. Sales of the so-called bonsai guitar are up fivefold this year as a new generation of strummers get into the groove. Tony Bonsignore has been out and about in London to find exactly why the kids now think ukes are cool. I'm Paul Gardner. I'm the manager of Hobgoblin Music in London. For at least the last ten years... The ukulele boom has gone up and up. It's a strong, steady seller. A lot of people are playing the ukulele. I teach a little bit, personally, um, mainly jazz. Jazz jazz ukulele? Ah, it's just something with a bit of swing. Tell us about the appeal of the ukulele over other instruments. Well, for a start, it's a small instrument, so it's a very portable instrument. It's great for, say, children to carry to school. You've got plastic strings instead of metal strings, so it's not going to hurt your fingers. It's a totally accessible instrument. And you mentioned schools there, so getting increasingly popular in schools. The recorder has always been that traditional school instrument, but you find a lot of guitar teachers are now moving into teaching 
not only guitar at school, but also mandolin, but um, ukulele as well. It's easy for a child to play. You need a couple of chords, and then you can be very happily singing along to a song. A recorder, you're playing it. You obviously can't sing at the same time. It's a very screechy noise. Um, but with a ukulele, um, it is a very soft and sweet sound. I'm Pauline Poole from Michael Faraday School. I teach in Year 4. I'm Performing Arts Coordinator, so we love playing ukulele. We love performing. What's the appeal? The appeal is that any child can access it very easily. You can have a, a, a song within an hour. Um, and as long as you've got the confidence to just try, you can get there. Hello. Um, my name is Angel. What is it you like about the ukulele? It's just a relaxing instrument to play and you just totally fall in love with it, like just playing once you are in love with the ukulele. It's just so relaxing. Can you give me your name as well, please? Rachel. And what do you like about the ukulele? It just makes my family happy and they go to sleep and then it makes me happy too. What, what's your favourite tunes on the ukulele? Uh, Price Tag. Price by Jesse J. Yeah. Oh, even I know that. Do you fancy playing uh, a couple of notes for us? Price tag. Okay. Everybody look to the left. Everybody look to the right. Feel that yeah. I play with love tonight. Cause ain't about the money, money, money. Hi, I'm the Rainbow. I teach for Learn to Uke, and we normally teach adults, but today you're here in the school, Michael Faraday Primary School. A few decades ago, it would have been recorders, wouldn't it? That the, the, the sort of the children would have learned to play music on. This is different. What's the benefits for them, and what's the benefits for the teacher as well? Um, the benefits of the children are that um, it helps with fine motor control. So I'm dyspraxic, so I have severe coordination issues, and I've noticed an increase in the way my hands move. I've also noticed a difference in the children. Um, also, they get to sing. So you know, if their fingers don't quite follow, they can still join in with the song in some way. I read a lot of the reports today. I think it's a little bit lazy journalism where people only talk about George Formby because there's lots and lots of amazing ukulele players out there and amazing ukulele bands that it's worth checking out. And I think they're the people who have sparked this latest craze, not you know, the people who are buying the ukuleles. They've no idea. They think George Formby is the grill maker. You know, they've no idea who he is. Very impressive playing there. Tony Bonsignori out swinging with the ukes in London. You're listening to the BBC World Service, the world's radio station, and it's hello to our listeners in Port of Spain, Trinidad on 98.7 FM, and good evening to you in Jerusalem, listening on medium wave 1323 kilohertz. Now, according to the stereotype, working life is all about inching yourself slowly up the greasy pole with success measured in terms of swelling pay packets and growing responsibilities. Our regular commentator, Lucy Kellaway of the Financial Times, is never one to accept received wisdom, and she says that caricature is simply false. Here she is. Not long ago, thousands of workers in the US were asked if they fancied the idea of being promoted to the rank of manager. You might have thought they would have mostly said yes. But they didn't. Two-thirds said, no thanks, I'd rather stick with the lowly job I have. So why don't most people want to be managers? Well, more than half of them explained that they liked the job they had and therefore saw no reason to change it. This strikes me as an excellent reason. About a third of the sample said that what put them off were the long hours and the responsibility that went with being a manager, which is also fair enough. But implicit in all this is a truth that companies try to keep quiet about. Being a middle manager is simply the most thankless job ever invented. Workers are not idiots. They look at what the people above them are doing and think, no way. If anyone still clings to the fantasy that it's going to be nice to be a middle manager, a big study written up recently on the Harvard Business Review website puts the record straight. 
It looked at companies that together employ 320,000 workers and examined the profile of the least happy 5% of them. You might have expected these to be mostly downtrodden foot soldiers or misunderstood cranky geniuses or the hopelessly incompetent who could be sacked at any minute. But instead, the typical profile of the terminally miserable is a middle-performing, middle manager who's been working at the company for five to ten years. These managers gave a litany of reasons for their misery. They felt underappreciated, overworked, not listened to, stuck and full of a sense of meaninglessness. But most of all, they complained that the people above them were not up to much. So what can be done? The authors of the study blandly conclude that it's all a matter of leadership. But I'm not so sure. Almost all companies are necessarily dysfunctional and the place that dysfunction hurts most is halfway up. It is the job of the middle manager to implement bad decisions made by others. It's their job to take responsibility for things that are not their fault. They can neither move up nor move back down. They're more buffeted by storms of office politics than anyone else. In all, it's not pretty. The true problem is not at the top. It's at the bottom. It's how do you persuade decent, hard-working people that it's worth trying to advance. Given how bad the journey upward looks, it's no surprise that the people who embark on it and emerge victorious at the top are so often bent out of shape. Meanwhile, some of the people who might have fared better at the top remain at the bottom, having wisely declined to climb at all. This is Lucy Kellaway for the BBC World Service. Maybe they should start playing the ukulele to give themselves a bit of a lift. To end, Will Bitter's report. Here, listen to the pupils at Michael Faraday School. Goodbye. You've been listening to World Business Report from the BBC World Service. For more news and analysis, download Business Matters, our daily hour-long mix of current affairs and debate published at breakfast time in Asia and Europe. We debate key trends in the worlds of work, politics, technology and the environment. Find it at bbc.com forward slash podcasts. You can also follow us and get our latest audio at twitter.com forward slash BBC World Biz and talk to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash BBC Business. realization that this might be a path forward to get part of his agenda. And strumming into the big time. Why sales of the ukulele are soaring. That's all coming up. The new Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, has embarked on a grand European tour. You could call it a charm offensive to try and persuade his European neighbours to lighten Greece's heavy burden of debt. Sensible proposals for putting Greece off the headlines. But for the moment, Greece is still firmly in the headlines. And with the worries about Greek bank accounts being converted from euros back to drachmas, cash has been steadily fleeing the country. The BBC's economics editor, Robert Peston, told me that a failure of Greece's current charm offensive could have dire consequences for Greece and the rest of the eurozone. This is you know, a hugely scary, actually, negotiation that's going on. Yet there's still 320 billion euros of it. The states couldn't be higher. Greece's banks can only get vital life support from Europe's central bank if there's a clear, agreed way forward for the country's debts. Without the life support, Greece can't stay in the euro. But looking relaxed in a green leather chair at Downing Street, Yanis Varoukakis has told the UK's finance minister, Chancellor George Osborne, that it was time for Greece to look to the future out of the limelight. We will come to every European capital like we're here today with very... For, I mean, broadly because, you know, the stakes are really all about whether Greece can stay in the euro. And if it doesn't stay in the euro, well, that could be very costly for Greece. It could be very costly for the whole of Europe. And we do seem to have two, uh, you know, rather irreconcilable positions. We've got Greece saying they want 
an easing of the debt terms and an end to austerity. Um, we've got other Eurozone governments saying, well, we bailed you out. And a- This is the download edition of World Business Report on Monday the 2nd of February. I'm Susanna Streeter. Greece's new finance minister begins a charm offensive around Europe. We will come to every European capital like we're here today with very sensible proposals for putting Greece off the headlines. But will a funding lifeline for Greek banks continue? We find out why anti-tax avoidance campaigners have a powerful new ally. It's not coming from the heart. It's coming from uh, pragmatic.